So now we're recording. Now for today's topic, Dr. Paula Spilner taught art and architectural history for over 30 years, most recently at Drexel University. While her dissertation was on urban development in late medieval Florence, upon moving to Philadelphia, she turned her scholarly attention to the 19th century and trained as a guide for the Foundation for Architecture. Serving as a tour guide for 15 years, she then managed the tour program and lecture series. Dr. Spilner has lectured on a variety of topics for the Foundation and its successors, Philadelphia Society for the Preservation of Landmarks and the Preservation Alliance. She is currently a board member of our SAH chapter, having been elected last year. And today we'll speak on her current research on the pre-Civil War development of Spring Garden entitled Thomas U. Walter and the Villas of Gerard Avenue. This talk is being recorded. We ask that you mute your microphone during her talk to prevent distractions. You are invited to submit comments and questions in the chat box and if you would direct them to me or make them live once the talk is over. Please welcome Paula Spilner. Paula, please share your screen. Okay, got it? Looks good. How do I get rid of that um, toolbar? We can't see it. Is it blocking your functionality? there. Okay. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my topic today is the transformation of a farm known as Green Hill Estate into a residential neighborhood in the 1840s. Here is a here's a survey of the estate carried out in 1842, just so you can see the extent of it. As you can see, it's crossed by Broad Street and pretty much bisected by Gerard Avenue. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this area, uh, I marked up a Google Maps map to show you the relationship of Gerard Avenue to uh, Center Square and also to point out that until consolidation in 1854, Vine Street was the northern boundary of the city. So the uh, Green Hill Estate was outside of the city of Philadelphia. Gerard Avenue is now an important commercial and residential corridor running east and west about a mile north of City Hall. Among architecture buffs, Gerard Avenue is perhaps best known for what has been lost. Many of you will know that the intersection of Broad Street and Gerard Avenue was once home to two of the most spectacular mansions ever constructed in Philadelphia. Sadly, both are gone, replaced by <laughs> not one, not two, but three fast food restaurants. What is not widely known, I suspect, is that on the blocks west of Broad Street, many buildings attest to the historical development of Gerard Avenue in the second half of the 19th century. I just put in uh, two examples from 
the beginning uh, uh, and the late years of the 19th century, Girard Avenue between Broad Street, uh, between Carlisle Street and Ridge Avenue is actually uh, a, a national uh, historic uh, district. What, is not what has not before been realized is that the development of Girard Avenue began in 1840 with the construction of five Greek revival villas. I call them villas because they're large houses set well back to the, from the street on tree shaded lots. And I will argue tonight that they were designed by Thomas Eustick Walter, best known today as the designer of the United States Capitol Dome, but that project was years in the future. More broadly, the, these Girard Avenue houses were part of a larger real estate development scheme to turn the Green Hill Estate, as I said, into a residential district. Um, for my purposes, that process begins in 1799 when the property was acquired by Edward Stiles. Uh, Edward Stiles was uh, an immigrant from Bermuda. He made his par fortune partly through trade and partly through what is politely called privateering, uh, alias piracy during the American Revolution. And I'm showing you, you can see up, in the, uh, up at the top of the map, the location of uh, his estate along uh, what was then the Wissahick and Pike, now Gerard Avenue, or now uh, Ridge Avenue, sorry. The name Green Hill seems to have been bestowed by the previous owner, one Samuel Meredith, a very prominent citizen of Philadelphia. He was apparently so proud of his country estate that he published this fulsome description in 1792. Uh, praising its healthful location. And the article was accompanied by this illustration of his house, also known as Green Hill, which Stiles purchased. And the, uh, the fence in front of the house, you can see that there really was a hill there. And the fence in front of the property separates it from Ridge Avenue. Edward Stiles died in 1804, his son having predeceased him. So his property, all of his property was inherited by his young uh, grandsons, Benjamin Stiles and Edward James Stiles. Uh, their grandfather had owned a townhouse in Philadelphia, but uh, they apparently preferred to live in Carlisle, um, about 120 miles west of uh, the city, where Benjamin Stiles attended Dickinson College. For the next 35 years, the Green Hill Estate was an income producing property for the brothers, rented out to various tenants. And the uh, district remained more or less rural until the late uh, 1830s, as illustrated by this a watercolor by David Kennedy. But the Green Hill Estate was on the brink of transformation. As early as 1787, the Pennsylvania Assembly had asserted its right to control development outside the city proper by laying out new streets. Uh, the immediate occasion was they were appalled by the haphazard development of Southwark south of the city, so they decided to do something about it. They mandated that new streets replicate the rect rectilinear grid laid out by William Penn's surveyor in 1862. And the act of 1787 calls for the creation of a master plan, and I'm quoting, of all streets to be laid out in order to provide certain knowledge of where and in what manner such such streets will in future run. The creation of this master plan actually took uh, decades. 
And I'm showing you a section of the uh, survey of the district of Spring Garden, which lay immediately uh, north of uh, Vine Street, the northern uh, boundary of the city. Here's the section of Spring Garden uh, east of Broad. Here's Broad Street and south of Poplar Street. Uh, this illustrates very well one striking implication of the survey. The new grid uh, relentlessly ignored pre existing property lines. You can see those pre existing property lines in blue here. A strategy that provide that created problems for virtually every landowner. I mean, what the heck do you do with that? Where's my with that leftover triangle uh, there, uh, sliced off from the rest of your property? Uh, to become law, the survey had to be approved by the court of quarter sessions. This was a, a many step process. And in uh, this case, the uh, document of confirmation uh, survives. Here is a spring garden west of Broad, which includes about a quarter of a green hill located north and east. Here's Ridge Avenue. So all this is green hill up here. And you will notice the little uh, eccentric grid uh, uh, on the south side of, of Ridge Avenue. This is Francisville, the neighborhood laid out by Trent, Trent, Tench Francis in the 1770s, clearly before the extension of the city grid was contemplated. The northern half of Green Hill lay in Penn Township. Uh, the, here's the survey that includes uh, Green Hill. Uh, here's Broad Street, as far north as Thompson Street. Uh, what I want, what I wanted to point out here was a detail. Can you see the little dotted lines that are labeled Poplar Street, Francis Street? Uh, in addition to ignoring boundaries of private, private property, the survey ignored pre-existing streets or superseded them, shall we say. So these are two streets that um, uh, would eventually be um, vacated, that is demapped by, the, by act of the state assembly. Now, once they, so by about, uh, in the late 13, uh, 14, 1830s, once they possessed certain knowledge of the new streets that would be crossing Green Hill, the Stiles brothers decided to monetize their property. And this is a portion of the deed of sale in which they sold a messuage. Messuage is the old fashioned word for a house in which they sold the Green Hill farm to seven individuals. The deed of sale is actually not very uh, informative. It was a straightforward uh, sale, but what provides uh, crucial details of the agreement between the Stiles brothers and the purchases is the mortgage, which fortunately is in print <laughs> in the chain of title book that compiled in 1841. So Benjamin and J Edward James Stiles stole, sold their farm, some 81 acres, to seven investors for $300,000. They took back a mortgage of $225,000. And most importantly, the investors agreed that they were to develop the property to dispose of lots or parcels for cash or mortgage or ground rent, uh, secured by substantial brick stone or marble buildings. I'll have more to say about ground rent in a minute. Now, who were these seven investors? They were drawn from the financial elite of the Philadelphia business world. The oldest, in fact, was Elihu Chauncey, 
member of the, of the venerable Chauncey family of New England. His, one of his ancestors was um, the second president of Harvard College. And he was a man of national importance, founder of, of the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. Uh, Thomas Dunlap, Joseph Cabot, and Joseph Calperthate were officials of high officials of um, the United the Bank of the United States of Pennsylvania, which was the successor to the uh, Bank of the United States, closed down by uh, Andrew Jackson. By the way, uh, both Cabot, I mean Cabot is one of the Boston Cabots. Uh, the other three were wealthy businessmen. Uh, Matthew Harrison is the most interesting to me because of the arc of his career. He started out, the first um, notices of him identify him as a hauler. In fact, he got a contract to haul away uh, garbage from city streets. But he turned early to real estate investing and turned himself into a millionaire, basically. A self-made man. Now, the investors didn't just roll up their sleeves and become real estate salesmen. They hired other people to do that for them. One was designated as the trustee, the attorney Henry Chester, who you know had his own links to the investors. Uh, Chester, by being made a trustee, Chester was the legal owner of the Green Hill Estate. And in all the deeds uh, in the first two years or so of development, he was named as the seller. Now, the second official, the second uh, person they hired acted as their agent. His name was Andrew D. Cash and he was a conveyancer. This is a term that fell out of use after the Civil War, but conveyancing is basically the business of transferring real property. Conveyancers did lots of things having to do with real estate. They arranged loans and mortgages, they traced chains of title, et cetera. But Andrew Cash uh, possessed a skill that was essential to the development of Green Hill. It's, uh, he, it's even mentioned in his obituary. He had an unusually fine faculty in adjusting party lines and just subdividing large tracts of, land, tracts of land into small lots, presumably exactly what he did for the Green Hill estate. Now, the contract was signed in December 1839. Only a few weeks later, about a month later, uh, the development of Green Hill was announced in the Inquirer. Uh, this is a kind of puff piece <laughs> uh, promoting the development, uh, possibly planted by cash. Uh, it, it reports, among other things, and I'm quoting, that a number of our most respectable citizens have already provided themselves with lots. Uh, this was not, as we shall see, is strictly true, but it made for good advertising. The article also names Andrew Cash as the exclusive agent, uh, real estate agent for the estate. In the same edition of uh, the paper, Andrew Cash offered lots for sale on uh, Broad Street, Gerard Avenue, uh, uh, and so forth. The southern, the, the half of the Green Hill Estate that lies in the district of Spring Garden. The first sales were officially recorded on April 25th, 1840. In other words, the first uh, deeds. And on that day, a large lot was sold to none other than Benjamin Stiles one of the former owners. Now, why he didn't just keep it for himself instead of buying it back from his uh, purchasers, I don't really know. But this is the Stiles lot on the, on Broad, on the northwest corner of Broad Street and Poplar Street. 
as it looked in um, about 1860. Uh, these days you will now, uh, what's now on the site is of course the Metropolitan Opera House. Notice that the house is surrounded by greenhouses. Uh, the many shade trees and gardens on the property were much admired even in Stas day. He won prizes from the Horticultural Society for his flowers and apples. Uh, because he had purchased the lot outright, Stiles was under no obligation to build, but build he did. And this is the earliest image of the house that he constructed. Now, I should say, I just want to say right now that the sum total of our knowledge of the Stiles mansion is contained in two historic house reports uh, from Penn students now on file at the Athenaeum, and they sort of launched me on my research. Now, in 1850, uh, the year in which Benjamin Stiles' wife died, he sold his mansion for use as a school to the Academy of the Visitation. Uh, there does exist an old photograph in the files of the Historical Commission. I haven't actually seen this photograph because the Historical Commission is working remotely, but I found a copy of it. This is my bad photograph of a bad copy of it in Robert Ennis's uh, files at the Athenaeum. Uh, my uh, judgment is that this photograph must date before 1876 because it was in that year that the house was acquired by Charles, Charles Hara. And it's often known as the Hara mansion. You can see that he added, uh, where's my cursor? You can see that he added wings on either side. And according to one report, Resurfaced the, resurfaced the house in marble. I'm not quite sure if that's true. And here's a wonderful photograph uh, in the of the house shortly before its demolition in I think 1907 for the construction of the opera house. Now the designer of the Stiles Mansion has long been known and is indeed documented. Here is Thomas U. Walter's own uh, account book documenting a payment from Benjamin Stiles for $100 to a design for a mansion on Green Hill. Please notice that uh, a few days later, Andrew Cash paid another uh, $10 for a drawing of Stiles Mansion. I, I just want to say uh, at, at this moment, I just want to say thank you to Bruce Laverty, who um, gave me complete access to all the Walter papers, as well as to Bob Ennis's uh, files, uh, and for many other kindnesses in the course of my research. Now, as paltry as it seems, $100 was about four times what Walter typically charged for a house design. It su suggests that he'd supplied a number of drawings, uh, perhaps elevations as well as plans, maybe even architectural details. And we can compare the $100 paid by Stiles to the $300 that James Dundas paid for 19 drawings, uh, plans, elevations, side elevations, uh, so on, and many architectural details. And in the case of the Dundas mans mansion, uh, which was under construction in the late uh, 1830s, uh, Walter also charged a fee for uh, construction supervision. In the case of the Stiles Mansion, 
we know that Walter was that Walter's involvement ceased with handing over the drawings, or at least his involvement was minimal. We know this because one of the builders of the house uh, sued Benjamin Stiles for non-payment of his bill, and he also see, uh, sued the contractor, one Charles uh, Mountain. Walter is not mentioned. Now, uh, in a similar case, uh, when um, a builder sued uh, one of the Powells uh, for non-payment, the architect was named John Haviland. So um, I think we can conclude that uh, Thomas U. Walter was not involved at this point. By the way, this um, suit had a prelude. <laughs> a few months before the lawsuit was filed, uh, Charles Mountain, a, here called an architect, uh, accosted the builder and uh, probably swore at him and called him some bad names for which he was um, fined. Charles, I looked him up in the um, Philadelphia Architects and Buildings database, and what they say is he is an architect about whom virtually nothing is known. So now we know two things about him. Now, one of the things that is missing from the, uh, one of the uh, important pieces of evidence that has been missing from any account of the Stiles Mansion is an insurance policy. Insurance surveys, <clears throat> including hundreds issued by the Franklin Fire Insurance Company, now at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and others issued by the Philadelphia Contribution Ship, which are available online. Uh, each Insurance survey provides a narrative description of the property and typically a plan. And again, I don't mean to add too many footnotes, but uh, my, life, my uh, work was made infinitely easier by the database of insurance policy, policies compiled by Jeffrey Cohen. Um, now, no evidence there is no evidence that Benjamin Stiles insured his house with either, the, either Franklin Fire Insurance or the contribution ship. But when, when he sold his house in 1850 for use at a, as a school, the new owners insured it. And here's the insurance policy dated 1850 to the Philadelphia Academy of the Visitation. Now this insurance policy adds invaluable information to the visual evidence that we've seen so far. In particular, it identifies the materials of the house. Uh, marble, three stories, marble portico with uh, uh, ionic columns as we saw in the images. And interestingly, a furnace in the basement for warming the building. Now the uh, exterior of the building was masticated. Uh, it doesn't mean chewed up. Uh, I found this definition of uh, mastic cement in a publication from 1844. So um, uh, it's, uh, the author praises it for durability and presumably um, it's easily uh, painted. Now, the big uh, jackpot of this insurance policy is the plan. Here's the fir first four plan of the Stiles Mansion in 1850. My uh, impression, as you can see, one reception room was repurposed as the chapel for this uh, Catholic school. But my impression is that no major structural changes were made to the mansion to adapt it as a school. It's a, a symmetrical telescoping plan that is it expands outwards as it recedes from the street. But what really impresses are the dimensions. This house was huge. 
74 feet deep, 100 feet wide. And notice that uh, when the doors were open to the hall, you had an unobstructed view from one end of the house um, to the other. I put in this uh, list of comparisons just to, uh, uh, to show you how big uh, the, the house really was. The uh, Hillteeth Physic House on 4th Street is still standing, of course. It seems pretty big, but it's only half the width of the um, Stiles Mansion. Woodlands is not quite as wide. Uh, uh, what really impressed me was that, uh, sorry, Independence Hall is only seven feet wider than the Stiles Mansion. It was big. And here's a detail of the, the, uh, the most striking feature of the plan, the center axis. It has an imperial staircase. In other words, a central flight, which goes up to a landing and then splits into two uh, lateral flights. And here's the hall as just uh, 20 feet by 25 feet as, as described in the um, insurance survey. It's actually called a, it's, they call, he calls it a rotunda, even though it's an octagon. And you can just see the initials here, FD. These are the folding doors that can be uh, folded into the partitions to throw the, open the whole length of the house. And the survey says it is lighted by an upright circular lantern on the roof. In other words, the hall rises through all three stories of the house. Here's a detail of the lantern from the 1852 print. Most, most uh, contemporary houses in Philadelphia, many contemporary houses in Philadelphia had roof lanterns, but generally had lanterns on the roof, but generally they were roofed. I have been unable to find any other upright circular lanterns. So if you know of any, if you know of any please let me know. Uh, one relevant comparison to this plan is this house. Uh, the Physic Roberts House, uh, once standing on Walnut Street, attributed, although not definitively, to John Haviland. There's the lantern up there, which is roofed. At least I think so. And this is a photograph of the hall of the Physic Roberts House, which also seems to, here's the, you can see the opening of the rotunda with all, what also seems to be a, an imperial staircase. So the Stiles plan is not entirely unprecedented. All this was, although this was a much smaller house about, I think it was about 50 feet wide. Now, very unusually, the insurance survey includes a plan of the second floor of the Stiles uh, mansion, the hall I think, I think these might be minor changes to the plan, maybe partitions put up to turn these into dormitory rooms. Uh, the hall, uh, the rotunda is now an ellipse with niches in the corners and the circular opening is uh, surrounded by an iron railing. Now, one could say much more about the design of the house, but at this point, I want to pose a question. Why did Benjamin Stiles build such a big house? Well, the answer to the question may seem blatantly obvious. He did it for all the reasons that rich men build grand houses. You know, prestige, reputation, yada, yada, yada. But I think something in particular was going on here. I'm quoting from uh, a little note in the Philadelphia Magazine of History and Bi Biography from 1884. In response to a query about the property, 
the author of the note uh, tells us something very interesting about the house. I understood that part of the conditions of the purchase was that Mr. Stiles should build a handsome house to induce others to follow his footsteps. In other words, the house was a form of advertising meant to attract the right kind of people to the new neighborhood of Green Hill. And I just, I wanna point out that this little notice, I never would have found this, you know, without Google, but this notice highlights the limits of official documents like deeds and mortgages. If such an agreement existed that Stiles should build a handsome house, it may never have been formally uh, recorded. This, the author of this note says that he remembers it, whether he remembers gossip or sort of general public knowledge of the time, we don't really know. Now, a, pro a, a second question probably seems equally ingenuous. Why did Stiles hire Thomas Eustick Walter? Well, by 1840, Walter was already nationally famous for his uh, design of uh, the main building of Girard College. You know, what more do you need? He was a famous architect, why not hire him? But here again, the, the documents uh, tell us something more. This is again from Walter's account book. It, it seems that, uh, it seems clear that uh, Walter had a long-standing relationship with Andrew Cash, the exclusive agent for the Green Hill Estate. Here are just two of the commissions that Cash sent his way before uh, Green Hill. Uh, one recent commission uh, also included Charles Lex, who was one of the investors in Green Hill. And Lex and Cash, the, the, uh, uh, Walter reported, actually visited him to ask him to uh, make drawings for a row on the, a row of houses on the almshouse lot. The almshouse was the old public charity building that uh, was sold when the almshouse decided to move to West Philadelphia. And this is the almshouse lot, which uh, A.D. Cash advertised for development, Charles Lex and John Grigg bought it and proceeded to develop it. Uh, and Walter may have been responsible for the design of some of the houses on uh, Spruce Street. Now, so in some sense, I would say that uh, to you, Walter was uh, Andrew Cash's go-to architect for important commissions. Now, at last, we turn to the villas of Gerard Avenue. Here I've mapped, like Benjamin Stiles, all seven investors plus Andrew Cash bought lots on Green Hill five of them on Gerard Avenue, three of them on Poplar Street, just to the south. The lots were as near identical in size as possible. And the terms on which they were acquired were also identical. These were very large lots, almost 200 feet on Gerard Avenue compared to a typical center city lot of maybe 40 feet for a big house or 60 feet. These lots were not purchased outright. They were sold on ground rent. And here I need to explain this form of land tenure. In a ground rent sale, the buyer pays a, a token amount at the signing of the contract, usually a dollar. The buyer is the owner of the property in every legal sense. He's free to sell it, for example, and build on it. 
But rather than paying cash up front, it commits to paying an annual ground rent, usually typically equivalent to 6% of the value of the property. And by the way, it's usually said that um, uh, the practice of ground renting was imported from England, which it certainly was, but it's demonstrably uh, medieval in origin. And if you're curious, curious, ask me after how I know that. The, for our purposes, the most important feature of ground rent contracts is that the purchaser agrees to build on the property, usually within one year. Uh, this is one of the investor contracts which specifies a brick, stone, or marble building of sufficient value to, sec to secure the said yearly rent. The point of the building was that the seller would have something to seize should the buyer default on rent payment. Now, all seven of the investors plus Andrew Cash built houses on their lots within, uh, actually within one year. And here's what we know about those houses. This is the uh, plan of Andrew Cash's house uh, from the insurance survey. Although it's not indicated here, it's described as having, notice that this is only, he uh, rented his lot in April. Only four or five months later, he's insuring the house. Uh, it's nothing out of the ordinary uh, double pile central corridor, central hall with the lateral staircase and the kitchen extending to the rear. Um, 43 feet wide. So just, just a little narrower than the Keith Hill Physic House in Society Hill. We are very lucky that Benjamin Stiles made a water, uh, that Benjamin Evans made a watercolor of this house shortly before it was demolished in about 1885. Uh, the three-story house with its portico surrounded by uh, a, uh, lots of trees, uh, a, a substantial um, lot. Now the watercolor calls this the house of William B. Mann. How do I know this is the same house that Andrew Cash built? Well, I did a chain of, I researched the chain of title from First of all, it looks like the insurance survey. Second of all, I researched the chain of title from cash uh, to man. Here is the house of Charles Lex on the next block, the, the 1500 block. Again, uh, two rooms on the ground floor, center hall, lateral staircase, kitchen in the back, a Doric portico with Corinthian capitals. Again, Evans made a drawing of this house, which is on the corner of 16th Street. The house next door is slightly later, although still before um, 1860. But again, uh, a tree shaded lot, Greek revival uh, features. Uh, this is the house of Joseph Cabot on Gerard Avenue from the insurance survey. Uh, slightly narrower than the cash house, only 40 feet again, with a Doric portico, pretty much the same plan. I can't show you, uh, I never did find insurance policies for McAllister and Chauncey, but this is the Hex Hexner and Locker map of 1860, uh, showing the footprint of St. Joseph's Hospital. Now, both of, these, both of these houses were sold for use as a hospital in 1849. Uh, and the footprints of the Chauncey and McAllister houses are still visible uh, um, um, within the alterations to adapt it for a hospital. As it happens, I did find a picture of these houses. 
uh, from a history of St. Joseph's uh, Hospital showing the McAllister House, which, you know, unusually it, it had a portico around three sides shown here and the um, Chauncey House. Now, I found this <laughs> at the Catholic Historical Research Center in, Phil in somewhere in the Northeast. I wouldn't have been able to get there without, uh, without uh, GPS. Uh, a wonderful research center with very hospitable curators. Probably not very well known. Now, the house of Joseph Cowperthwaite is known only from a, a narrative description, so I, I um, reconstructed it here. Again, uh, uh, a, por a portico outside with um, uh, four columns and capitals. Uh, again, I, I haven't found any uh, an insurance policy for the Dunlap House, but it appears on the Hexamer and Locker uh, survey of 1860, and there's the footprint over there. So, what can we say about these seven houses? Pretty much identical varying only slightly in measurements and detail, things like the kind of marble used for the fireplaces um, inside. Indeed, they are so simple that one wonders if an architect as opposed to an experienced builder was even involved. <laughs> I think so. And I think it was Thomas U. Walter. Why do I think this? Uh, because of this. Another entry in the account book, payments by Andrew D. Cash, agent for the Green Hill Estate. And here we have two, three commissions for Green Hill, two mansions and an office. And I don't know about this. I, you know, I wanna say that that was for Green Hill too, but I couldn't swear to it. First thing to notice is the dates. December 2nd was the very day on which the contract, on which the Green Hill Estate was sold to the seven investors. Uh, what about the office on Green Hill? This uh, paid for in June, 1839. Well, as it happens, an office was added to Andrew Cash's house. Here it is in the drawing, and here it is in a later insurance policy. It wasn't actually insured until uh, the 1850s by a later owner, but at least we know that there was an office attached to this house once owned by Andrew Cash. Now, I would suggest to you that um, many, many months of planning preceded the formal sale of Green Hill to the investors. Remember that Cash started uh, offering lots only uh, a month after uh, the signing of the contract, at which point the entire um, estate must have been surveyed into measured building lots. And the inquiry reports that by the end of January, they had seen designs for houses. So the dates don't bother me. Why are specific clients not named here? I think because cash was acting on behalf of the investors. Commissioning designs from Walter to show to the investors as templates or suggestions to be executed by builders. One explanation for why the houses are so similar. One last point. Thomas U. Walter was actually was actually an investor in Green Hill. Uh, on the first day of sales, 
he bought a lot on the southwest corner of Poplar and 15th Street. Um, it was a big lot, relatively speaking, 137 feet wide. What he intended to do there, nobody knows. Um, he had just finished building himself a grand house downtown on Arch Street. Maybe he was going to build a country retreat uh, on Green Hill. In any case, he never built it. In fact, when he went bankrupt in 1842, the lot was seized and sold by the sheriff. But I wonder, uh, Walter is the only architect who acquires property on Green Hill. And I wonder if this lot wasn't a kind of reward for services rendered, you know, as the official or unofficial estate architect. Now, uh, there is much more to be said about the development of Green Hill, uh, which is beyond the scope of my lecture today, but I just wanted to um, spend a few minutes on a kind of teaser um, overview. Uh, for one thing, the houses, uh, the villas that I have described were exceptions. Uh, most houses, uh, most houses were considerably smaller. Uh, one common type in the early years of development were twin houses, uh, lots, lots on Broad Street, uh, which measured about 60 feet by 100 and 60 feet seem to have been created with this kind of house uh, in mind. Uh, here's another double house on uh, Poplar Street. Now this house is, is, is interesting because it's one of the many, many houses. In fact, the majority of houses on Green Hill were not purpose-built for clients. They were built on speculation by building tradesmen, as were these two um, houses built by house carpenters. For men like these, ground, uh, ground leasing was a particular boon. They could acquire a lot for a dollar, build a house and sell it for a profit, perhaps even before the first ground rent payment came due, typically, uh, half the rent was due six months after the initial contract. Uh, this lot has an interesting history. Um, well, I won't go into it. Uh, but as it happens, these two houses actually survive. This is what they look like today. Hotel Carlisle. Don't ask me. Uh, I haven't been, in, it's obviously much changed. I haven't been inside, I haven't dared. Uh, it's, some, it's some kind of, I think it's some kind of SRO, I don't know. But somewhere in there are two houses uh, built in 1840. I should say that at one point, 1425 was owned by William Elkins before he built his big mansion on um, Broad Street. Now, one of the one building tradesmen, a uh, speculative builder who seems to have specialized in such double houses was the house carpenter, Joseph Montgomery. Here's an insurance survey of four two double houses, four houses that he built on Broad Street. In addition, in 1843, he built 14 similar houses on Poplar Street. So he, I, I suspect that uh, Montgomery uh, employed quite a large crew of builders. He, as I said, he wasn't out there with his sleeve rolled up building houses. He was a contractor. Uh, with a team of builders to help him get these houses up quickly. Uh, most building tradesmen rented much smaller lots, typically 16 to 18 feet wide, especially 
in the southern part of the estate, south south of uh, Poplar, Poplar Street. This is uh, are some lots on Poplar Street, east of Ontario, so east of Broad Street. <clears throat> Most acquired one lot, some took on more, uh, like the ho house com carpenter Thomas Patterson, and you can see his name several times on these lots, who acquired nine lots in 1841. For an 18 foot wide lot, he paid $45 a year. And this is the same block in 1860 with little houses lined up. I think it's important to notice, I, I regard that I can't show you any examples of these houses. They're all long gone. But it's important to notice that big lots and little lots Big houses and little houses are segregated from each other. Little lots cluster together, big lots cluster together. In other words, there seems to have been an economic and perhaps social hierarchy built into the lot plan of Green Hill. Something to think about. So uh, I hope that I have contributed to your understanding of the career of Thomas U. Walter, and also of the development of North Philadelphia. On that note, I wanna go back to the 1802 map. The Green Hill Estate was not unique. It was one of dozens of farms and country retreats situated in the rural district north of the city of Philadelphia. Sooner or later, every one of those property owners faced the inexorable tide of advancing urbanization. What I call the triumph of the grid. What decisions did they make? What strategies did they adopt in the face of this inevitability? Uh, did they resist, like Richard Wister, who kept his property intact for many decades? Uh, here you can see how the pro original property lines were oblique to the, to the grid imposed in the 1830s. He held on to it for so long that even William Elkins couldn't acquire that last little triangle to build his mansion in the 1890s. Did you ever notice this? Pretty weird. So did they resist or did they jump right in to the speculative market like the four uh, sponsors of the Fairmount Docks development, uh, which never materialized by the way, uh, and was eventually, the property was eventually incorporated into Fairmount Park. So these are open questions waiting to be explored. Who knows what you might find? So Well, thank, you, thank you for a, uh, a thought provoking, thoroughly researched, beautifully articulated argument. Um, it, uh, I'm sure there, yes, thank you, Jeff Cohen, thumbs up. Um, everyone, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone saying that this was really a terrific way to spend a um, Sunday afternoon. And I, I know there are some comments and questions. And you can still watch the Eagles game. And you can still watch the Eagles game after we're done. Absolutely. Um, what I'd like to do is I do find um, there was already, uh, please feel free to turn on your cameras and, and your microphones if you wish. I, there's already a comment by Warren Williams. Paula, I find it interesting that this high-end real estate development was occurring just north of the intense industrial development of Bush Hill 
at Spring yeah. Garden Street. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, my husband pointed this out to me too. I haven't really thought about it. Um, I'd have to check the dates. I mean, what did Bush Hill look like in 1840? I don't think there was much there. Hmm. I mean, when was the Baldwin? When was the Baldwin factory built? Anyone? Anyone? Paula, can you hear me? It's it's yeah. Lauren. Yeah. Um, I think Baldwin is starting in the twenties and thirties. Okay. Not much more, and certainly Bush Hill is not in full swing until the Civil War. Yeah. But but I think I think there's some stuff going on, uh, mostly because the railroad tracks are there. Yeah. And well, the, the, all the I can say at this point is that the investors apparently judged that the demand was for housing. Uh, so they created residential building lots. There's absolutely no commercial activity within the green. Uh, uh, allowed for in the Green Hill estate buildings were built. How in, so clearly intentional. Of course, commerce infiltrated its way in after a few years. I also might say that the initial development was not that successful. They, uh, at least half the property was not, was still vacant after a couple of years, but that's, a, it's another story what the investors did about that. Well, also with industrialization at this point, people are still figuring out segregating industrial f facilities from residential. It's the early days of industrialization and sort of the later mindset of get the factories away from the houses. I'm not sure it was there at this point. Well, wait, wait just a minute. Baldwin was there because the railroad tracks. I mean, that industrial right. zone was because of the railroad tracks, wasn't it? Right, yes. Did you say that? Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I could just uh, join, uh, pi uh, pipe in, um, uh, Matthias Baldwin actually, uh, uh, Wait, something happened. Sorry, can you hear me? Now, yeah. Um, Matthias Baldwin drew his own plan of the the first of the the, the Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1832. The the Athenaeum actually has a pencil sketch in, in his hand, so yeah. it, it goes fairly early. But uh, this still was a good distance away from that heavy industry. Yeah, and when you think so. that the, the the Spring Garden neighborhood, which developed maybe a little bit later uh, than Green Hill. Uh, was much much closer to uh, uh, to the tracks, so to yeah. speak, and uh, not nearly as high in, in elevation. You know, which I think made a huge difference uh, well, in terms the, of yeah of the the, the the notices of Green Hill, starting with um, with uh, Samuel Meredith, are constantly praising its healthful location, elevated. This was intended as a suburban neighborhood away from the um, from the um, from the city. I, I think it's not, it's not walking. I wouldn't say it's walking distance to Center City. The people who lived up here had horses. <laughs> they had carriages. You can see the stables on some of the developments. I've been trying to figure out when omnibus service arrived, but at least initially, you had to ride your horse or take your carriage down to your office mm -hmm. on North Six, on Sixth Street or whatever. I, I think that the, the primary reason for the, the failure uh, of most of the development uh, was the timing. Uh, because yeah. the bottom fell out of the economy uh, in, in exactly. 1842 and 44. Yeah. And, and so, Walter was certainly not alone in going bankrupt and losing, uh, you know, he lost his own house as well yeah. as that, uh, uh, that investment property he had. Well, oh, there's also the panic of 1839. I mean, why did they get, why did they start this in 1839? I think partly, I mean, You know, 6% was considered a good idea at the time. And eventually, well, by 1875, the estate was fully developed, but it took a long time. 
I don't know if anybody actually made any money. Yeah. Uh, looks like Polly Schaefer has her hand up. I guess, would you like to ask a question or make a comment, Polly? Oh yeah, hi, Paula. Hi, um, Polly. How are you doing? This was fabulous. I really enjoyed it. It was great. Well, great you're, work. A, you're a spring garden person. Great work that you've done, yeah. Um, just to comment on the past conversation, I, it's from my research, I, this the later developed Western Spring Garden neighborhood that came about in the 1850s and 60s, the people were very used to crossing those tracks and, you know, living tooth and jowl by, um, you know, small manufacturing and large manufacturing. So um, I would suspect that that wasn't um, a big issue, um, the, the location of, of the industry. Um, but um, Paul, I wanted to ask the this the short lived Spring Garden uh, Commissioner's Hall, which uh, was yeah. very lavish. Have you? I ever know come? it's amazing. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've been compiling a file of uh, district halls. Somebody should write about it's. Somebody should write about them. Yeah, I just wondered whether clearly it would Spring come Garden. Up. Do you remember the date of that? I think it was only around for like six years before consolidation. Um, okay, so uh, but there's those lithographs. Clearly, very rich. To yeah, be such a lavish. So I wondered whether you had come across anything with your research on on how that came about. But no, yeah. no it's been in the back of my mind. I mean, yeah, what Penn Town Penn Township uh, Penn District was erected in 1847, and they they too had a. a a town a district hall yeah by the way i just wanted to go back to this i mean here's another speculative de development the plan has been this is right along the school kill um a plan that was announced in about 1840 and it failed completely the uh, in spite of being i mean matthew New newkirk was really rich um it just never got off the ground. Again, perhaps because uh, Isaac Lloyd went bankrupt. I mean, tough times. Sorry, was Paula, there there? I have a I have a comment, and maybe we can continue this offline. But what struck me was your mention of Thomas Dunlop who actually owned the Roseneath uh, estate on Schoolhouse Lane, which he bought in 1847 and lived there until he died in the 1860s. So someday maybe you and I can talk a little bit more about that situation. Well, I, generally I only wanted to mention things that happened before they got involved in mm -hmm. um, Green Hill. Um, Charles McAllister, what's that estate on the river? Glen Ford. Charles McAllister built Glen Ford. He didn't mm -hmm. call it that, but it was after his. So whatever they, in... I don't think the investors intended to live in these houses. No. I think they were advertising. All of them kept, only Andrew Cash moved to the neighborhood. We know that he lived there. I think these were a form of advertising, you know, to create this, um, genteel neighborhood. Um, Matthew Harrison bought an estate along the school kill. So a lot of the, I have evidence that a number of these, well, first of all, the Chauncey and McAllister houses were sold after nine years. Mm -hmm. Others were rented out by the, uh, the the Harrisons stuck around for quite a while, but these were not these were not the primary residents of any of the investors. Yeah, I understand. Jeff, you have a question or comment? Yeah, yeah. Paula, great research, really impressive, and I I look forward to your chasing down the commissioners' halls. That will be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't have done it without um, places and time, Jeff. Seriously. Oh well, thanks. And your your article on. It has place in the title. What's it called? Places oh, yeah. and time. Evidence of place. Evidence of place. Weird place. Title. That was my Bible. <laughs> I mean, you can't, don't forget that I, I knew nothing about Philadelphia before I got here. I was all late medieval Florence. <laughs>
Well, it's just because this image is up, it, it brings up two distant Latrobe connections because Latrobe is kind of the professional grandfather in some ways of Walter. Um, do you see the little diagonal buildings on your um, that are near the left center of the Lloyd yeah. plan? Things that's, that were there before the grid. Yeah, that's Sedgley. That's Latrobe yeah. Sedgley. It's the only yeah. footprint we really have of it. Mm -hmm. um, but the other Latrobe connection is um, uh, what you call the upright circular lantern. This was a big fight that Latrobe had with Jefferson. Over what? Um, oh, the, the, uh, the White House, uh, the, the Capitol. The Capitol, about, about um, you know, skylights in the Capitol. And Latrobe kept saying, you know, skylights always do one of two bad things. They leak. Either, <laughs> they leak or they cause condensation, one or the other. Right. So he said, what you have to do is you have to have upright sashes held aloft. In other words, vertical sash windows that you can crack open and have a cupola on them so no rain comes in. Um, and that, that would be a much better solution. So that's what he did at the Capitol. I'll take a look at that. Is that, yeah. can you think of any other examples? I mean, presumably the Styles house was glassed in in some way. There's just no way to see it. I guess in some ways, you know, the Merchants Exchange was also upright sashes held aloft. But that has a roof. Right, these all do. These all have a but, roof but the that styles with doesn't. Ease. I'm sorry? The Styles uh, Lantern doesn't have a roof. You sure about that? I, th I thought there was a roof and the light was coming in from the sides. We can check. It's way back at the beginning. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's a circular, effectively a flat dome there. And then below that are the sash windows. I don't think it was an open oculus, if that's what you're thinking. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, no, I think that's the lesson they learned. Is okay. that that's the lesson they learned is open oculuses aren't great for rain, or if you have a, a skylight there, they're not great great for uh, condensation. So flat dome. So what's that? What are those posts? Mm -hmm. I think those are equateria. I think they're a little. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Got it. It's a little bit like a squashed merchants exchange lantern. Right. Okay. I'll look into that. But great talk. But still quite different from the. Uh, I mean, that clearly has a roof. Yep. With light coming from the side. Okay. Who knows? Well, I'll uh, look into it. So any thoughts on where this plan comes from? I mean, there's nothing really innovative about it. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, I think it's pretty impressive. <laughs> In fact, the only thing that I could find uh, to compare it to was, um, Huh. Phil Helena, Phil Elena, which is just a couple of years later. What what made me think of comparing them is the um, the long axis, completely unobstructed. I mean, the houses are so open, no doors between the drawing rooms. It's incredible. And I think one thing they had in common was they both had central heating. They had furnaces in the basement. Where are the fireplaces? You know? Hmm. Uh, same thing, by the way, I think with the uh, Dundas Lippincott house. No, no, I think that too had, uh, I have to look into it more, but something is going on here that allows this kind of openness in the plan. I mean, I thought at first of um, the woodlands, but the woodlands has, you know, all those doors. Uh, even though it does have a, a, a vist, a, a view shed, it's not open like this. Something has happened. Anyway. Oh, by the way, I might as well just 
I didn't mention the house of Matthew Harrison, who was one of the investors, who did build this house on his lot on Poplar Street. Now, it's, I don't think it's the first house on the site. Uh, he didn't build this, he didn't get this insured till 1851, and it's obviously quite different from the other investor houses. For one thing, it comes right out to the street, and it's a double house. It's, it's a sort of double house in that the insurance company considered it two houses. They issued two insurance policies, but it's for Matthew Harrison and his son. So they share a hall. They have separate stair, only one, only one dining room. So the house has one hall and one side is dad's house and one side is junior's house. I don't know of any other similar examples, especially with two insurance policies. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just so for completeness, there's the Harrison house. While we're talking, I encourage the um, people here to look in the chat uh, box because several of our uh, several people have actually put information in there about the Archdiocesan Research Center and some other information that people may find helpful. So please take oh, advantage of was that. that uh, I can imagine who that was. Um, We have uh, Marianne uh, it, Eves. It wasn't me. It was Marianne Lee Eves. Oh, not Lou. Uh, hi, hi, Lou. I wanted to say hi. <laughs> Hello, Jeff. Hello, Paula. I, don't, I had such a good time up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I found exactly what I was looking for. If I may, it's it's a little off off your your uh, geography, but. Um, I think it's the 2100 block of Mount Vernon Street. In the middle of the block are um, look like what look like twin houses that do not match. They're set back and they have porches yeah. and yeah. Th they do not match the uh, speculative uh, brick rows and the rest of the block. So they were they were built there long before anything else was on that block, and they they match. In, de, in your description of, of that that uh, genre of uh, building these twin these twin properties twin houses send me the address and I'll look it up yeah and I'll say I'll maybe send you a picture too great other questions or comments? It's interesting without without moving, um, the houses went from being suburban villas to being places that were within reach. But the critical thing, I think, is the streetcar network. Yeah. That from the 1850s on put them in within reach, but before that, they were much further away. Like I said, I've been trying to figure out when omnibus uh, service started. I, I also, you know, water. Were people willing to build houses without water? And it turns out that city water service was extended in the neighborhood just about 1840. Mm -hmm. How do I look at chat? A few, uh, it's right next to the it. share it. screen. By the way, uh, the only acknowledgement I've ever come across of the houses, the first houses on Gerard Avenue is, was in the, uh, these are the houses that replaced uh, Andrew Cash's house. Are, are they, am I right in thinking they've now been attributed to Willis Hale? I'm not sure. Anyway, 1400 block of Gerard Avenue. The only reference <laughs> to the uh, one of the villas that I've come across is in the Habs report <coughs> on these houses, which says which says that development was retarded 
because of an old house on this site belonging to William Mann. <laughs> and I just thought it was interesting. Just anecdotally, um, Actually, I think when my, my parents uh, had to resolve a ground rent situation in no the 1600 block of uh, Wood Street, which is uh, half a block above Vine, um, back around 1952, 53. No kidding. <laughs> I don't know when it fell out of fashion. I mean, it was ground rents were quite a, a popular investment for people because it was a you know, guaranteed 6% income. So ground rents were bought and sold like stocks. You buy the ground rent without buying the house. Yeah. Anybody who's interested should take a look at Donna Rilling's book, mm -hmm. um, which has a thorough discussion of the implications of ground rent for um, entrepreneurial tradesmen. Paul, I think you were magically channeling an answer to a question posed about 30, 40 years ago. Oh, goodness. When the, when the Biographical Dictionary of Philadelphia Architects yeah. <laughs> by Roger Moss and Sandra Tatman was first issued, Frank Toka wrote a review of it in the JSAH. Oh, good old Frank. <laughs> and Frank said something like, well, first he said, this ought to be a database. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but then he said, look at all these commissions for Andrew, Andrew D. Cash. No kidding. Somebody ought to figure that out. And it took 40 years. Yep. How perceptive of him, my goodness. <laughs> How did he notice that? Uh, in, in the listing, there's a lot of A.D. Cash occupant, yeah. location unknown yeah. commissions. In the biographical... Most of the listings are from, from uh, I'll have to check that out. I thought they were mostly from the Walter's account book. That's probably where he picked it up. Yeah. Okay, I've got to look up that. Was it in the JSAH? Yeah, a long time ago. Okay. Well, through the miracle of the <laughs> digital age, I'll look mm -hmm. it up. It'll be a footnote. <laughs> <laughs> Paula, there's people have also contributed comments. Uh, Bruce mentions that the horse street car started in the early 1850s. He believes yeah. that would make sense from what you've been saying. Uh, and Warren Williams and um, Polly have been talking about uh, Walter's Preston retreat with its cupola nearby. That was after though, wasn't it? Close. I'll look it up. Oh. Okay, omnibuses possibly. No, what, as early was, as... what was um, Walter's relationship to Haviland? I, I think they were the two big shots in town in the 1830s. Competitors, in other yeah. words. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, that attribution to Haviland is not secure. It's based on sort of indirect evidence. But the house was being constructed about the same time, maybe a little earlier. Walter apprenticed with Haviland for a short time. I thought it was Strickland. Uh, uh, most, it was mostly with Strickland, but he did do a stint uh, in Haviland's office, according to his own description of his architectural education. Oh, okay, I'll have to look that up. Okay, so. And, and they would have known each other's work and he oh, certainly cool. he certainly didn't mind cribbing, uh, cribbing uh, Haviland uh, with uh, the Moyamensing prison, you know, which was Walter's first major work. So, so um, anybody, but Bruce and um, Jeff in particular, do you think I'm right in interpreting that um, payment for houses on Green Hill? Do you think I'm on the right track? You mean in terms of the the the, the date that they were uh, that the contract was made? No, that uh, yeah. Cash is paying for houses, designs for houses on Green Hill. Yep. Why? Yeah, I think I think you are. And and and, and uh, Walter had experience in building houses, uh, you know, uh, through the grant ground rent plan, both as a builder uh, and as an architect. Uh, and there were at least uh, two instances where he as served a, as, as a both. Builder. Yeah, 
as bricklayer, as bricklayer. Oh. Yeah, so he he sort of spans that that transition in his, in his own career um, uh, with two houses, uh, two at least two rows that were uh, were built on um, uh, ground rent. One was the fourteen hundred block of Walnut Street. Another one was it was the thirteen hundred block of Bud Street, which is uh, now bur bur buried underneath the uh, Wanamaker building. Oh. <laughs> So, but so he's working on that in 31 and 30 through 33, just as he's just as he's starting his career as as a an architect with a capital A. Right. And again, uh, the only reason I know about that is the same reason you know is that Bob Ennis took uh, copious yeah, notes. Exactly. So, would anybody be willing to knock on the door of the Hotel Carlisle with me? <laughs> I think I think there's an SAH uh, uh, tour. Uh, uh, we could. <laughs> what? <laughs> Maybe we could get a group rate. Uh... <laughs> you know, I'm scared. I mean, what are the chances? What are the chances that anything is left? I mean, the original. I have the insurance policy for the original house. It had a classical portico. Blah blah blah. Clearly. <laughs> much has happened who knows <laughs> if there's maybe there's a mantelpiece left inside i have no idea so any volunteers <laughs> it would be fun Let, let's wait till it gets warm and i'll see if i can organize a you know a, a posse to, to go up there Walk by. A posse is a good idea yeah. <laughs> well um paula if you um if you would stop sharing we could have everybody who's left turn on their cameras and their microphones and give you the closest thing we can to a, a live uh, applause, um, which would be um, still on Zoom, but at least you would be able to see us and hear us. So um, thank you so much for a well, really wonderful I'm presentation. I'm so happy to finally had an opportunity to talk about this. We're, hey, we're so excited you did. Well done. Oh, Doc, hi. Hi. Thank you. So many old friends. Larry? Hi, Paul. So because we had a rough start, uh, I'll just remind everyone that we have uh, another um, uh, remote presentation on December 2nd. It's a Thursday evening, George Dodds. We'll be talking about Alfred and Jane Klaus. I hope you will join us again then. Uh, and um, until then, stay well. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And uh, again, uh, um, I, pleasure yeah, seeing can everyone. Can I just say one? Can I just uh, say please, one thing? Please do. Anybody thinks of anything they want to tell me? My email address is peacefilner at gmail dot com. So, all right, go. comments. Appreciate it. Right. So long, everyone. All right. Thank thanks. You. Paula, so yeah. I'm going to stop recording. Okay. And